Well, welcome uh, this evening to Jewsbury Evangelical Church and to this, uh, the sixth in our series of Redeeming Power. Whether you're watching at home uh, or whether you're here in the building, you're very welcome. We're thinking about how to use power well. And uh, we're shifting our focus this evening uh, from church to home and in our relationships uh, at home, but also with one another more generally, with people. So if the title is Uncovering Oppression at Home. We are going to speak a bit about uh, domestic abuse and coercive control. And the reason for thinking about that is because Paul says in Colossians 3.19 that husbands are to love their wives and not to treat them harshly. And so there is a warning there in Scripture that we need to take seriously. The aim is for men, and the spotlight will focus more on men, and the reason for that will become clear. But of course it applies to all of us as men and women to use our power for the good and blessing of others, not selfishly and in ways that will cause harm. Now, this issue is nearer than you think. Because the acorn of sin that is in the heart of each one of us can grow and can so easily be destructive. And it's very easy to think that this is somebody else's problem, but it's not. And sadly, in the church, then, men have used the Bible's teaching on submission in a twisted way to justify abuse. But this uh, message, this evening's uh, service, is not just for men, and it's not just for people who are married. It is, as I've already said, it's about how we relate as people to each other. So it's for all of us to think about. And we are shining a spotlight on things that are often invisible and elusive and hidden with the aim of bringing them into the light. And this isn't just for older people, this is for young ones too, because the attitudes that we're talking about and the behaviours start young. They might only be seen in full effect later on. But whatever age you are, you need to take this seriously. Now, what we're going to do this evening is think about a number of stories. So, uh, got uh, four headings, all using the word story. So, a shocking story, a common story, a better story, and a powerful story. And uh, the way we're going to go this evening is in a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to sing. And then we'll do the first two, and then we'll pause and sing again. And then we'll do uh, the second two, and, uh, and then that will lead us into communion. And that's the plan uh, for this evening. So let's, uh, as we come to think about all of this, come to uh, hear God speak, to praise his name, let's pray and seek his blessing upon us. Our God in heaven, we come this evening with humble hearts. Uh, we come before a God who is all-powerful. A God who ultimately judges each one of us. And a God who knows uh, all about us and all that's going on inside our hearts. And Lord, you know the attitudes that there. You know the battle with pride and selfishness that we all face. And Lord, we pray that as we think about this subject this evening, that your word might convict where it needs to convict. It may comfort and encourage and inspire where it needs to do that. Lord, we pray that all of us would come open and ready to listen and to hear what you have to say from your word to each one of us, whatever our situation, whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we're uh, young or old, whatever our situation, male or female, Lord, help us to hear, and not just hear for others, but hear for ourselves too, and that you might richly bless us. Lord, we thank you that your word doesn't just come with a set of rules, but it tells us about a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, who forgives and restores and changes. And so, Lord, however uh, failing we may be, we know that we can come and find hope 
and encouragement and blessing from you because of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and your incredible love for us. So Lord, we pray that our experience this evening might be rounded and full as we enter in and learn of you. And Lord, uh, inspire us by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. So hear our prayers and help us now, we ask. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing, Come Let Us Sing, of a wonderful love. going to read from God's Word now. We've got various passages that we'll read as we progress through this evening. And we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 4 and uh, read Genesis 4, 1 to 12, the story of Cain and Abel. Where we read this, Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, desires to have you, you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While, the, while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what you have done, Sorry, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which is 
opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. I'm not planning to go into great detail of the, this story, but uh, it's a shocking story, isn't it? The first murder in the Bible. Cain kills his brother Abel. Two boys who grew up in the same family, the same parents. And it's shocking. Why? Why on earth would one brother kill the other? Sibling rivalry seems to have got out of control. Well, the answer, of course, is he couldn't bear the fact that his brother's sacrifice was acceptable, but his was not. That's the, the issue of difference, isn't it? That uh, 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 Cain brought some fruit to the soil and Abel brings an animal as a sacrifice. But instead of seeking God, he kills his rival. Why on earth does he do that? Even when God comes and speaks to him and says, why are you angry about this? And ultimately, the issue isn't with his brother, is it? It's with God, because it's God who's made the distinction. Well, actually, the, the ultimate reason, of course, that Cain kills Abel is because he believes he is the centre of the universe. He is the most important. And he cannot accept that it's any other way. And so uh, he has to kill the one that is standing in the way of how he sees things. Let me tell you about Vincent. Vincent is standing in the darkness, dissatisfied, staring at an office block and waiting. He has his knife to the ready. From the office emerges Donna. Her pace is brisk. She is heading for her car. Rince, Vincent runs and grabs her just before she arrives at her car and stabs her 38 times. Donna was Vincent's wife. And he is now in prison for her murder. He's not been violent before. And after he killed her, he phoned 999 to confess to the police and explain what he had done. And now when he's talked to in prison, he believes he is the victim and has been let down by everybody. He said, she was wrecking my life and no one cared because she had said she was leaving him. And this, in his eyes, was punishment for what she was going to do. His sense of injustice was more important to him and how he viewed the life than her life. And he expected his children and the courts to stand with him and to see that what he had done was perfectly reasonable and acceptable. And he cannot understand why his children want nothing to do with him and why he's been found guilty. Why? Because he believes he's the centre of the universe. His world is all about him. Now, when you look back on his life, the danger signs were there. He was incredibly controlling. The family had to watch his favourite soap opera and they all had to be there right from the beginning. He was compulsive about it. Donna lived in fear of challenging Vincent. He was never violent 
although he made threats to kill himself when she suggested things, which is obviously often a way of people manipulating others. People knew they had a bad marriage, but actually they had a dangerous one. And when she said she was leaving, he planned it, and then he killed her. A version of that shocking story happens twice a week in England and Wales. Twice a week. Two women per week are killed by their husband or their partner. Three a day in the USA. Women have met a person who is capable of murder. They've fallen in love with them, they've moved in with them and married them and then tragically their life is taken. In 2018, 277 women were murdered in England and Wales. 89% of them were murdered by somebody they knew. And 77% of them, it was at home. By contrast, 499 men were murdered in England and Wales in 2018. And 70% of them were murdered by somebody they knew. You see, you're far more in danger from people you know than random strangers. I know that's different from how the TV dramas work, but that is the truth. Because strangers are much less likely to be motivated to kill you. If you don't know them, they're not going to have that same motivation. You see, Jesus reminds us, doesn't he, in Matthew 5, where the problem lies. Matthew 5, 21, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. It's our selfish hearts. And when we step back from uh, murder and just talk about just, when we talk about domestic violence. So in 2018-19, there were 80,000 defendants prosecuted for domestic violence offences. 92% of them were men. It's not that women, that, but this is why I'm leaning towards men, because it's a bigger issue that way. And it's closer than you think. And this is shocking. Our desire as human beings to be the centre of the universe puts those closest to us at danger. So that's the first thing, a shocking story. But secondly, it's a common story. Um, in the Times magazine, we just get a newspaper on a Saturday, the Times, uh, and uh, in the Times magazine a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, a regular feature, but um, it was talking about Kanye West and his latest relationship. And um, the uh, person doing it said they were very concerned for him because of the way that, or concerned for her rather, because of the way he had uh, just uh, uh, this whirlwind romance. And he'd taken all away and suddenly he'd got rid of all her clothes and given her an entirely new wardrobe in the way that he felt she should dress. And uh, in the article, she referenced this book called In Control, Dangerous Relationships and How They End in Murder by Jane Moncton Smith. And she said it was her uh, all-time go-to book for 2021. And um, uh, in this book then, this is where the story of Vincent that I've just told you came from. Uh, she lists eight stages of uh, dangerous relationships, of uh, um, 
that can end in, in murder and she's tracked back to see what the warning signs are so that people can be alert to them. So a history of control, a commitment whirlwind, uh, then living with control, and then there's some trigger that sets something off. Uh, maybe a, say, I want to leave, or uh, you know, a, a, a rejection of this kind of control, which leads to an escalation, and then a, a change of thinking, and then planning, and then ultimately to homicide and or suicide. And underneath it all is this coercive control, this abusive way of living. Let's now read from God's Word, James chapter 4. As we try and understand this a little bit more, James 4, 1 and 2. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. So the reason people kill is to get what they want or to stop losing what they think they deserve. So it's because ultimately it comes from the heart. Desires are at war within us. So we have to ask ourselves this question, what do we really want? What is driving us? Particularly when we get angry, what is it that we really want? What is making us so angry? And often we look to others to give us what we want. And that leads then, when we're, we're trying to extract, as it were, from others something that we feel we want and deserve, it, it, it starts to lead us to, to control the other person in some way to ensure that they give us what we really want. Now that can happen in any relationship between two people. Any relationship or friendship, when we try and get things from others, will lead us to try and control them in some way to make sure that they are satisfying what we want. Now of course marriage is the most intimate of those relationships where two people, a man and a woman, commit themselves to be together for life. Two selfish people who often can come into that relationship trying to get something and look to the other one to give them something to satisfy them. And inevitably that will lead them to try and control the other person to draw from them what they want for themselves. And so oppressive people make it a place of domination, where they try to dominate. And it comes from an inflated sense of me, of my desires and what I want. And I look to you to give me what I want. And when you don't, then I get angry with you because you are failing to give me what I want. And it comes from this assumption that we're somehow owed preferential treatment and we're, we're, we're owed an unwavering allegiance and we will use uh, manipulation and we will use pressure to get what we want. And when others fail us and don't give us what we want, we will retaliate. We'll wound to keep power. This oppression then of others, is that's what leads to and brings about what's called coercive control. It's not provoked by the other person, as those who do it say that it is. It flows from a sense of entitlement that, that you or I think we have. 
that makes us think that we've got this entitlement to take something and draw something from the other person. I demand. I am owed. I have a right to insist. What I want matters most. It's back to seeing ourselves as the centre of the universe. But that's where we have a choice. The choice is, do we live self for what we want? Or do we actually have an obligation in the gospel, which we'll come to later, to be those who are sacrificial and giving instead of taking? But oppressors only see one path, fulfilling their desires. And all the actions are justified to get what they want. And they often exhibit patterns of behaviour then, of demanding things which become entrenched and unbending and unrelenting. So you end up with a toxic, entitled person who feels they're so important, particularly in that most intimate of relationship of, of the home and of marriage. And they deflect all blame and they will admit no wrongdoing and they'll rationalise any anger and punishment that they meet out against others. And it just creates then inside marriage a, a climate of fear where the other person is constantly trying to walk on eggshells to keep the other one from getting angry and punishing them in some way. Now, of course, they'll do that in lots of different ways. It's not always going to be physical, it might be emotional, it might be financial, it might be who they're allowed to see. So, how do we know when something's wrong? This book, uh, Is It Abuse? A biblical guide to identifying domestic abuse and helping victims is very helpful uh, uh, by Darby Strickland. And uh, she has a list of a number of things that uh, entitled people think. So these are the signs that something is wrong. As we go through these, I don't want you to be thinking about your husband or wife or a friend or somebody else. Think about yourself. Is this a description of me? So entitled people think, it's all about me. I've got a special status. I'm the head of the household. My rights matter most. Others are here to provide and serve and facilitate me. It's all about my needs and desires. Well, just think about when you do that in a marriage then, uh, the other person, so if the husband thinks like that, then the wife will be just become oppressed and crushed under the weight of her husband's self-centeredness. It's far from something which is mutual. It's become all one way. It's all about him and what he wants. The second way entitled people think is you need, you and I need to listen only to me. Because I am always right. And I know what's best. Other people are just wrong because I'm always right. Is that you? Is that how you think? And obviously then in a marriage relationship, the other person's opinions are not going to be valued, are they? They're hardly going to get a sentence out before they're going to be shut down. They feel they'll have no say. They're going to feel alone and fearful and depressed. The third one she suggests is rules are not for me to follow. 
minister there to keep me happy? Because after all, everything's about me. And so, where we have rules, well, they're not for me, they're for you. Because I set the rules for you to follow so that you serve me. And of course, a marriage built like that then leads to being overwhelmed by rules and a whole life walking on eggshells. Fourthly, fourth characteristic or fourth sign that something is wrong is people who say, my, my anger is justified. You see, it flows, doesn't it? If I'm always right, and I always know that I'm right, well then if I get angry, well clearly it's just flowing out from the fact that I'm right. And so my anger is entirely justified and is always somebody else's fault. And a marriage like that, with somebody like that, it leads to just a relational enslavement. Because you're all the time going to want to avoid being on the receiving end of a blast of their anger. The fifth sign is that other people attack me. It's funny, isn't it, that these people who are very quick to get angry and tell you how it should be, tend to be very, very sensitive. And any raising of a concern, any raising of a complaint is seen as an attack on them because, well, it follows, doesn't it? They're the centre of the... They are the most important. They are the king of the castle. And if you're married to somebody like that, then you're going to just grow in fear. Fear that you can't be honest about your thoughts because they'll, they'll be uh, thrown back at you. Final sign that something is wrong is, I don't have to appreciate what you do, but I demand that you appreciate what I do. It's like the bank account mentality where you remember all the good deeds and you stock them up and cancel out any shortcomings. But this only works one way. It's not a two-way process where there's give and take and forgiveness and so forth. It's all just all centred around me. Well, a, a marriage that's based like that is always going to be skewed, isn't it, in favour of the entitled spouse, making making. Uh, the other defensive all the time. And so if you're married to somebody who is exhibiting these characteristics, then they'll show itself in control in what various ways, physically or verbally or emotionally or financially or spiritually. So what should you do with what I've just told you? First of all, we have to examine our own hearts because we're all sinners. That acorn of sin and selfishness is there in each one of us. And all of us have a tendency to want everything to be about me. So we have to examine our own hearts and say, Lord, show me. And convict me. And help me to repent. It may be that as we've made that description this evening, some of you listening will say, help. I'm in an unhealthy marriage. Don't despair. Seek help. Seek the Lord. Let things, seek that things be turned around. But don't be satisfied, say, oh, well, it's just, a, you know, he, on some days, you know, he tends to be a bit like this, but one of the problems is it tends to grow over time. And maybe some of you are saying, actually, I think, or I'm wondering if I'm in an abusive marriage. Well, then, 
We do need to seek help. Because it needs to change. Because it's not healthy. It's not godly. This is an all too common story. Well, we're going to just pause now and sing. Sing a song of uh, repentance. Uh, Depth of mercy uh, is the song. It's just two verses. Uh, Let's drop ourselves, as it were, cast ourselves again on God's lavish mercy for selfish, wretched sinners with angry problems. Let's cast ourselves on his mercy and forgiveness as we sing this song together. Come on now to talk about a better story. So we want to read now from uh, Mark 10 and then Ephesians 5. So this is the passage in Mark 10 where uh, James and John say they want to sit at Jesus' right hand and left hand. And Jesus calls the disciples together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So then Ephesians 5, we're going to read a bit about marriage in a minute, but let's just get the context by reading verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then we go on to verse 21, Ephesians 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. So there's a better story than the one we've been thinking about. And the better story is where there is power under, not power over. This is the key thing you need to take away this evening. Power under, not power over. Power over is what Jesus rebukes the Gentiles for. They lord it over them, exercise the authority over them. It's self-promotion. It's self-uplifting at the expense of the other. It's me using any power that I have to get what I want from the other. And as we've seen, ultimately it leads to death. But power under is very different. Power under is what Jesus says, as his followers, we must have. And it's humility. And it's love. And it's service. It is other-orientated. It's using what power we have, not for ourselves, but to lift up the other. So an example would be, you know, when you have gymnasts and cheerleaders and those at the bottom who have great strength and they use their power to hold others up, that they'll be able to do fantastic things and can entrust themselves completely because they've got them and they're holding them. And it's in that sense that we are to be power under, using our power for the benefit and blessing of others. And the great example, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who did not come to be served, but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many. So that's what Jesus is talking about in Mark chapter 10, as we read. And uh, husbands then are called to show that kind of power under headship. And being a follower of the Lord Jesus means learning to love as Christ loved and to use power well. And notice he says, among you it will be different. Our example is not uh, uh, the successful leaders of, of the world. The example for us to follow is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be different from what our natural selfish hearts would want because a great change has taken place. And now we've become disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we don't press down and restrict and dominate and control and subdue. But instead we serve and we practice humility and we promote freedom. We're different. So in Ephesians 5, then, Paul gives some instructions to husbands and wives. But before you get to the, the detail, uh, you get the context, verses 1 and 2. Follow God's example as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It, links directly back, doesn't it, to what Jesus said about how he was laying down his life as a ransom. And Paul says, that's the example we are to follow. And then he's the greatest power under example. And then we read verse 21. Submit to one another 
out of reverence for Christ. And this is it where it sets the tone for everything that comes after, to instructions to wives and to husbands. There's a need for mutual submission. Both the husband and wife have to come at marriage with an attitude that seeks to serve others first. And as I say, that's not just the marriage, is it? That's the attitude we should have in all our relationships. But of course, marriage is the most intimate of those. Seeking to serve the other before myself. And spirit-filled people are submissive willing to place themselves under. Remember, this is a heart attitude. It's not about me anymore. It's about me doing something for somebody else. And husbands are called then to have a submissive kind of authority. That's not a contradiction. It's not lording it over. Remember, it's power under. We're called to be humble men, selfless men, not preoccupied with me and what I want. And then he goes on when he talks to husbands. We haven't got time to go into all the detail of this passage. But when he talks to husbands, he says to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's the what power under looks like in practice. It's sacrificial. It is costly. It is self-denying. It's funny how uh, one book leads you to another, isn't it? So uh, I was reading this book, very helpful book, and uh, I was thinking, well, but I need something that helps to takes it further to, to, particularly for men, and how do they get their heads around all of this? And then she footnotes, I don't need to write that because it's already written, so I'll oh, better order that one then. So, uh, The Heart of Domestic Abuse by this guy, Chris Moles. Gospel Solutions for Men Who Use Control and Violence in the Home. It's brilliant. This is what he says. Whatever will bring her joy and be to her benefit, I will submit to do. Happily, because all I want is her joy and spiritual benefit. Whatever will bring her joy and be to her benefit, I will submit to do. Happily, because all I want is her joy and spiritual benefit. Power under working for the good of the other. That, of course, is the same for parents. The same principles apply. We use our authority as parents for the good and blessing and benefit of our children. That's the same for us as elders or leaders in the church. We're to use this, have the same attitude. This is radical. This is a complete change of direction to the way we naturally, selfishly want to live. But that's what the gospel is all about. Loving leadership and direction and protection and safety and security and strength and provision. That's what we're being called to do. And it is a big ask. But we need to be absolutely clear as we've looked at those passages from Mark's gospel Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, and then Ephesians 5, 21 and following, we have to conclude this, that a husband who lords abusive power over his wife is not a disciple of Jesus. Because if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, there has to be a completely different attitude at work. But if you go on Christian Twitter, you'll see that there are many husbands out there who just do not get this, who see it as their role, God-given role, to subject their wives to do whatever they want. That's not biblical Christianity. The heart of pride longs for power over 
but the heart of Christ calls for power under. So my calling as a husband is to use my power to serve my wife, not myself. Now I've got a message for the young men. So I'm looking over there because that's where the main young men are sitting. You need to show this kind of attitude now. This kind of attitude which is, what can I give? Not what can I get? Because it starts young. It starts in the heart. If you're a follower of Christ, this is what he's calling you to be like. And to the young women, less of them, maybe they're all watching, I'll look at the camera. <laughs> this is what you should be looking for in a man. Not somebody who is preoccupied with themselves. Not somebody who sees you as uh, an object to be uh, greatly blessed by their supreme excellence. But somebody who is sacrificial and humble and servant-hearted. And I want to say to the young women, run from men who are self-obsessed. They will not treat you well. You need to be on the lookout for men who really get what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. A real humble servant willing to lay down their lives for the good of others. Choose wisely. You see, there's a better story where two people whose hearts have been renewed come with that submissive attitude, looking out to be a blessing to each other. And come together, marriage then is the most wonderful of relationships to have and to enjoy through life. We've got to have the right heart. And getting the right heart comes from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that those who don't know Christ, by his God's grace in this world, can't have excellent marriages, but they're always pictured after this spirit. Finally, a powerful story. You see, there's another marriage story in Ephesians 5, 25 to 33, and that is the story of Jesus who's the husband and his bride, the church. He says, verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So it's in the same breath as talking about husbands and wives and how they relate to each other. He's saying, actually, I'm talking about Christ and the church. And this is the most powerful story ever. Because he came for her, he left the glories of heaven, and he came into this world, he became a man. And how did he win his bride? He won her by love and by sacrificing his life to set her free from sin so she could enjoy him forever and ever. He cleanses her through his great sacrifice on the cross. And one day... The Lord Jesus will behold his bride in all the beauty that she will have because we will have been made perfect and ready for him. And he is looking forward to that great day with anticipation because that's why he came. And you and I can look forward to that day too because we'll be in his arms forever and ever. And every human marriage is to be a picture of the ultimate marriage. 
and the ultimate marriage of Christ and his church should shape every Christian marriage. Let's be people who are so taken up with Christ and his sacrificial, generous heart that we become people of sacrifice, not entitlement. If there's one big lesson for you to take home tonight, it's this. It's not all about you. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because he thought it was all about him. He wanted to be the centre of the universe. Why did Vincent kill Donna? because he thought it was all about him. What makes men oppressive and abusive when they think it's all about them? Of course, we could say the same for women too. And the whole message of the Bible is pressing upon us to say it's not all about you. God is the one on the throne. And Jesus has come it's actually all about him. He has come to save you so that you can be brought back into a right relationship with him and then learn a better way to relate to others. And if God gives you a husband or a wife to relate to them as you live in, in the footsteps, in the shadows, in the in the following on of the Lord Jesus Christ and looking forward to being with him, when we'll spend all eternity worshipping and praising him, because it's his world, and he is king, and he is Lord. It's not about you, it's about him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray that our experience may be the better story that we would use our power not to lord it over others, but to be power under. And that you would turn us from being selfish, preoccupied, entitled, arrogant people, and you'd make us generous and kind and humble and full of service. Lord, I pray for every husband who is here, that you'd help us to love our wives as Christ loved the church, to have that submissive kind of authority. And Lord, if our attitude and mindset has been wrong in this point, help us to repent and change. And Lord, we pray for all of us in all our different relationships that you'd give us that same humility and keep us from pride. And most of all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who came to win us and make us his people so he could have us and enjoy us forever. And may we truly look upon him and enjoy him and love him with all our hearts. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing now as we prepare to come to the uh, celebrate communion together from the squalor of a borrowed stable.
to the Lord's Supper now. And um, just in terms of practicalities, we are doing it slightly differently. Uh, we're still going to bring the bread round, but uh, uh, we're not going to lift it off into your hands. You may take it yourself. It's pre-cut. Please don't uh, like, you know, slabber all over them. Just <laughs> grab one carefully uh, and take it. And once the bread has been brought round, you, you uh, eat the bread as you receive it. Once the bread has been brought round, we'll bring the wine round. And again, just take one and then we'll all drink together. So it's very similar to how we've been doing it. But instead of being given a piece of bread, you take a piece of bread. Um, this is for needy people to, uh, when we plan this series, I thought it would be lovely when we've been thinking about this whole subject to end by thinking about the Lord Jesus and his great sacrifice. Because some may be feeling very guilty this evening, may have a big burden and we'll see again that Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient for all of your failings and all of my failings. And what an appropriate way to end then this, this evening as we think about what he has done and how uh, even our great sins are not unforgivable because he forgives all sin and that's why he came. And um, this is a meal for those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. However shaky that faith may be, uh, it's for those who've trusted in him. Obviously if you've grown up in the church and you've come to faith and you've not yet been baptised, then get baptised first, uh, we ask, before you start taking the Lord's Supper. Let that be the symbol that you've professed faith. If you're a member of another church and you're here with us, then you're very welcome to partake. Let me just uh, read to you the very familiar words of 1 Corinthians 11 that just remind us what we're doing. Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we're looking back, but we're also looking forward to the great marriage feast of being with Christ as his bride. And uh, we won't need this meal then, because we'll be with him and enjoying him in person forever and ever. Let me give thanks. Father in heaven, thank you that we can end our time tonight uh, lifting our eyes away from our own situations and hearts and focusing on what you've done for us you're the one who came and died and rose and is coming back and your grace is sufficient and rich and wonderful and we praise you for it help us now as we partake of this bread and wine bless it to us we thank you so much for these physical emblems which remind us of all that you've done and may they be indeed uh, great meat as it were and uh, tonic and encouragement to our souls uh, tonight so hear us now we pray as we come in jesus name amen together as we remember.
with one more short song to finish to just fix our eyes again on our wonderful Saviour. But before we sing, let me just say again, if you've been uh, impacted by uh, what you've heard this evening and you do need help, then please do seek it. Um, please don't think that I'm a world expert on this subject. I'm not. Uh, obviously read a little bit, been thinking about a bit. I'm happy to try and help, but also point you on to others that would be better equipped uh, to, to help if that would be uh, appropriate. So, uh, but uh, uh, um, the whole point of raising these things and talking about them is that we might grow and learn and change and, uh, and not live in sin or in as oppressive situations which are unhealthy and where change needs to come. Well, let's uh, sing of the sufficiency of our Saviour, uh, the Lord Jesus, as we close. Jesus, Jesus, all sufficient. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for those who've joined us from home. May uh, God bless you and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you in person or you joining us online again soon. This is the end of the service. <laughs>